Listening to podcast is no replacement for real training. While we attempt to provide accurate commentary, we hold no responsibility on how you use the information we provide. Get medical training. In the blink of an eye, everyday order can be replaced with once-in-a-lifetime chaos. Be prepared. This is the Civilian Medical Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is episode 14. I am your fearless navigator, Sean Heron, from We Like Shooting in the Firearms Radio Network. And with me, as always, is the guy who leads this show, (laughs) the the man with the information, the guy who knows the stuff, Dietrich, the skinny medic. What's up, buddy? How are you, sir? I'm doing well. A little bit out of breath. I just had to go up some stairs, so... I think this is like two weeks in a row for us. We're back on a streak, I guess. <laughs> I know. It's amazing. And I think we're even going to record an extra one. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be a good medical week for us. I know. I'm getting lots of messages. Whenever we skip a week, I get messages like, hey, where's the podcast at? <laughs> I know. Trust me. Welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> like if you skip putting a video up on YouTube or something, you, know, you might get one or two. But man, you skip a podcast and it like messes up people's lives because they're like, okay, on, on Thursday morning when I drive to work, I listen to the civilian medical podcast. This is what I do. So yeah, when we mess when we mess with it, we mess with it, and we apologize. Just sometimes life gets in the way. Yeah, I agree. Like I was, you know, if I miss a week on YouTube, no one says a word about it. But we've, you know, our lives have been busy all of a sudden, and we've missed like a week here, a week there, and like I'm getting emails and messages. I'm like, dang, sorry guys, we'll we'll, we'll get on it. So <laughs> we <I are>. apologize. <laughs> We're on it now. Um, hey, last week we did like a deep dive into tourniquets and the the new uh, recommendations for the committee for T Triple C. And I thought that was awesome. I hope everyone else enjoyed it. And this week uh, is near and dear to my heart because I spend most of my life in this condition. And what we're going to talk about today is altered mental status. Yeah, like uh, we talked about tourniquets last week. And then the week before that, we talked about scene safety and scene size up. And we kind of brushed over like altered mental status patients and just kind of talked about it. So I thought this week we could kind of dive a little bit deeper into things and and kind of give some people uh, a little bit of explanation about what causes someone to not act normal. And using normal is a very loose term, uh, but uh, kind of gives some idea of what's going on there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've actually seen this a couple of times in the real world. So this is, it's definitely near and dear to me and man, I'm excited to kind of just get into it. Where do you want to start? Yeah. So, you know, this is something that we run into a lot with, you know, EMS is, you know, someone's calls us because someone's not acting right. Maybe it's their friend, their spouse or whoever. And so we have to go into the scene and you kind of have to start using clues. You'll be your detective to try to figure out what's causing this person to not be acting normal. So uh, this is, this is more like, you know, investigative work, trying to use clues to figure out what and you're building a case as you go along to figure out what's going on with the patient. So, Uh, We'll kind of brush on some of the top things that cause people to not act normal. So one of the things we talked about with the scene safety podcast was about making this scene safe. And this is something that you need to uh, think about. We'll even watch uh, the after action report video here in a few minutes and talk about it. But, and, but it's one of those things where the guy was unconscious and all of a sudden he ends up shooting a firefighter because they didn't do a sweep and, you know, making sure these patients are unarmed uh, is is important because if you get injured, then you can't help anyone else. So if you have a patient who doesn't know, I usually ask them a few basic questions, you know, like I introduce myself and I'll ask them their name and they typically should be able to give me their name pretty quick. If they have to think about it, I'm like, okay, maybe something's going on here. And then I'll ask them, you know, uh, do you know where you're at right now? And do you know what day of the week it is? Or, you know, do you know who the president of the United States is? kind of start asking some good general questions and you know you kind of have to use those as relative terms too because if you're talking to an elderly person who's retired or you know it's like they may not know what day of the week it is honestly but they may think it's a monday and it's you know saturday like they don't really care they don't go to work anymore so maybe ask them about a major holiday you know what was you know what's getting ready to come up what's the big holiday coming up or what what do we just celebrate things like that um, I always get a, a kick out of asking who the president is because you <laughs> always get a response on that. Like one side or the other is like that SOB, like, all right, which one are you talking about? Like, which, so <laughs> it, um, it's, it's fun to kind of ask that question, but you're trying to get a baseline about where they're at. You know, if I'm talking to an elderly patient, I may, 
ask them, you know, hey, who's this person here with you? And it's just their spouse, whatever. You're just trying to figure out, ask them some general questions. You know, I wouldn't ask them what seven times seven is or anything crazy, but you know, at least give them some information to kind of give you an idea of where they're at. Yeah, hundred percent. And I mean, when you come into a scene and you, you're not sure what happened or whatever happened, you're always under direct threat. And the first primary fundamental thing of direct threat is gain the advantage over the threat. And if you don't know what the threat is, you cannot gain an advantage over it. Exactly. And this could even be, you know, an elderly patient um, that maybe sugar drops like something like that. And you go start pricking his finger and mess with him, pulling his arms. They can get very agitated and he may want to fight. And, you know, you don't want to hurt the elderly patient things like that. And, you know, what if he pulls out a little derringer out of his pocket or a little revolver or whatever, you know, a little 38 snub nose, he pulls it out. Like that's a bad day uh, for everybody involved. So whenever someone starts, they don't, they're not able to answer those baseline questions for me. I will, you know, Hey, let me just check your pockets real quick. Make sure you got anything I need. And I'll check their waistband. Just kind of just double check. They don't have any weapons, a knife, um, you know, a, a gun or something like that, because, if they are not able to answer those basic questions, then they don't get to play with their toys for right now. Like, doesn't mean I won't give it back. Unless yeah. it's like a cool gun, then I'm going right. to keep it. Not joking. Uh, but, you, you know. You know, if it's an old guy, it's going to be 1911. And yeah, it's like a 1911 or a snub nose <laughs> revolver, like a little 38, 357. Um, but, you know, we are, I, I'll, I'm going to take those from the patient. If there's law enforcement there, I'm going to let him uh, him or her handle that, that firearm. Uh, but, you know, just to make sure that everyone is safe as can be when you're dealing with these patients is, is important. Yeah, 100%. And it's, it, it is very important. And the couple times that I've, that I've dealt with altered mental status in the real world, uh, it was absolutely my most important thing is, is the scene safe? Am I safe? Like, period. If not, I'm out. You know, exactly. I'm, you, know, if you need to back out until you can figure out, get a game plan to make that scene safe. Uh, you know, I've had a situation where I had a, the, a police officer called us because they thought this guy was drunk and his ends up his blood sugar was, was low. But this guy had a nice uh, pistol. I don't remember what it was now. It was like a nickel plate. I saw a mirror being like shiny silver uh, right on his waistband. And the cop never like checked him. And I was like, hey, let us let me see that. That's a nice cool gun. And I cleared it right there and handed it to the officer. And the cop was like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like, <laughs> no big deal. But that's why I'm here. I'm like, you know, once we got the guy's blood sugar back up, he immediately like reached and grabbed. He's like, oh, my gun, where's that? Oh my gosh, where's my gun at? And I was like, we got it taken care of. We'll get back to you in a second. And he's like, oh gosh, thank you. Like he, he was worried about it. But I mean, you know, there again, his sugar was, you know, say it's in the thirties. He's not able to make sense. And I start jerking and pull him out of the car. Like he's going to go back to whatever kind of defensive training he has. And that could have been a bad situation. Definitely. All right, let's get into the causes. Uh, first up, you have infection. Yeah, this is something that, especially like pre-hospital right now is very big. Like, before years ago, like if someone had a UTI or whatever, we're just like, all right, no big deal. Let's just take it to the hospital. But the more research we've done on these patients to an infection, that's a big deal. Uh, you can get diagnosed with being septic uh, or sepsis. And that's basically like a super infection. You're in shock. And we talked about shock several episodes ago. But that's this is the medical side of things. And your heart rate is going to be up. Uh, your respiratory rate is going to be up. You're going to be running a fever. Your blood pressure can even be low. And even some severe cases, your your temperature can drop. So you're actually below the normal uh, threshold for your temperature. And you have a very high percentage of, of dying when you get diagnosed with being septic in the hospital or if even outside the hospital. Uh, you're, you're in bad shape very quickly. So this could be from like a UTI, uh, a urinary tract infection. This could be pneumonia. This could be skin infection. Uh, anything that you know could cause those foreign bodies, this your body starts reacting get that infection, and your body's not able to fight it. And we see this a lot with elderly patients. You know, we'll go check on them and like, oh, grandma's not acting right. And you walk in, you smell like that very foul smell of urine. You're like, oh, she's got a, a UTI. And you check her, and she's running a temperature of 102.5. Like, how is this going on? Oh, it's been going on for three or four days, and her heart rate's like 120. You're like, oh, she's septic. And so this is just something progressively getting worse. And it generally starts out with grandma's not acting right. Our, our grandpa just hasn't been feeling well. He's been coughing up yellow sputum. Okay. So he's running a fever. He's coughing up a productive cough. He has pneumonia more than likely. And he gets diagnosed with being septic. So they have to give IV antibiotics. It's a very aggressive treatment. We give lots of IV fluid for him. We give antibiotics. And they have, it's, it's a bad situation for someone 
who gets diagnosed with being septic. So just kind of looking for those signs and symptoms, fever or just everything. I mean, there's, there's tons of stuff, right? Yeah, there's tons of stuff. So you can start out with an infection and you're just running a, a fever. No big deal. Your heart rate's fine. Your blood pressure's good. Everything's fine. So you go to the doctor and you get on antibiotics and it's no big deal. It's when you start getting those signs and symptoms of shock, I mean, the high heart rate, the high respiratory rate, that's when you start getting to more of the septic. And that's when it, it becomes a very real situation. So, you know, if someone has a family member or they're you know, looking at a fever, I would absolutely be checking their vital signs. And, you know, the moment their heart rate got above 90, uh, then I would be reaching out and going to the emergency room. I think that's when it comes an emergency situation. Yeah. One time I thought somebody was septic because they were just not acting right. And then I was like, oh no, you're just a woman. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Oh, there goes the hate mails right there. <laughs> we haven't gotten any. Actually, I don't think I've ever gotten hate mail for this show. I haven't gotten anything. I haven't gotten anything like hate. Just just critiques about my tourniquet wording. Corrections. <laughs> and Corrections. And we said ketosis and we meant ketoacidosis. Yes. Those are the only two so far. Yeah, we're good. I think as much as we talk during these episodes, we're fine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so just kidding, ladies. I was <laughs> Strokes, uh, definitely, definitely a big deal. Let's talk about those. Yeah. So strokes, this is where you either have two basic causes of strokes. It's either a clot or a bleed. And the clot would be something that stops blood flow into a portion of the brain. And then a bleed could be, you know, something very fast that happens or a slow bleed, but they start opening up and you have blood inside of the the head and the head typically is very compact. Like there's the brain doesn't bounce around typically. Uh, when we get older, the brain does shrink a little bit. So that's where like you're there again, talking about elderly patients, they fall and hit their head. Uh, their brain does shrink a little bit. So then if they hit their head, then the brain itself can move forward and hit the back side of the skull and cause some bruising, cause some bleeding. So we have to really look out for these elderly patients. Uh, for that symptom, but typically our, you know, kids, uh, adults, their brain is very padded and very solid. So falls really don't, uh, it has to be a very significant fall for them to injure that way. But a stroke is going to be something that happens uh, pretty quick onset here. Uh, we can do a stroke exam, uh, which helps determine you know, if they are having a stroke. This is uh, typically I ask them to uh, smile for me. You want to make sure their smile is nice and even uh, the, you know, it comes up, uh, like it should uh, look at their like muscle tone in their face. It shouldn't be drooping any uh, on one side or the other. And then you can ask them to hold their hands up, hold their hands in a straight, you know, straight out in front of them. If one falls, they're not able to lift it up, things like that. That could be signs of a stroke. And then their legs, I'll ask them to you know, push the gas pedal, like you're pushing a brake or gas pedal to make sure they got some movement there. Again, you it signs positive sign of a stroke would be, you know, they have weakness to one side or the other. There's, profound weakness to the right side or the left side either way and we want to know what time has happened when you're talking to the doctor you're talking to ems if you called 911 for this because the treatment plan is pretty time sensitive so you want to know hey i was listening to a civilian medical podcast at 12 30 when this started boom it the problem comes in is like when you call us at six o'clock in the morning and you said your wife was fine last night. We went to bed at 10 o'clock. She woke up like this. So we don't know when the stroke symptoms actually started. So that really causes a problem with the doctors, you know, when they're going to provide treatment for these patients. So you want to know a, a definite time. Like, all right, we were fine at nine o'clock in the morning. We went to breakfast at 930 and boom, her, she wasn't able to move her left arm. So kind of giving that good time frame uh, will really help when you're talking to EMS or the doctors about this. A uh, clot, like those types of strokes are generally pretty, I say mild, but I don't like want to downgrade it, but like yeah. they are that weakness, you know, no big deal. It's the bleeds, uh, like the head bleeds, man, those can be violent. Like those, those are the projectile vomiting that you just like, just vomit just comes straight out of their mouth like an exorcist. I mean, it's crazy. Um, they're going to be unconscious. Um, these are really bad and you, you kind of can, that's how you really tell the difference. This is like, all right, her speech seems a little off, and her speech is slurred. The corner of her mouth is drooping. You can pretty much understand that's an ischemic stroke. Uh, they can give some medicine for it, bust the clot up, and it's a big deal. But all of a sudden, you get that one that's you know maybe they got high blood pressure, and then 
all of a sudden they start projectile vomiting, they lose unconscious, they go unconscious. Those are more your bleeds. So they're more severe. Yeah, those are those are definitely scary ones. So Bell's palsy is a thing. I've actually known three people that got Bell's palsy. Um, I guess maybe in the last decade or so. And originally you start to think that it's a stroke. So what is Bell's palsy first off? Um it, it's it's a nerve thing basically yeah yeah I, I can't i'm trying to think of what the technical term does the call like but it, it's a nerve and um i can't remember how like how i want to describe it yeah it's just like a condition where your face kind of droops a little bit so people think stroke pretty much immediately they wake up in the morning or you know just suddenly they cough or something and half their face is droopy and and everything so whenever i saw that I was like, holy crap, stroke, but they didn't really have any other symptoms whatsoever. And who knows what even causes Bell's palsy. I think that it's, it can be viral. It can be herpes. The only reason I'm bringing it up is just because someone has a droopy face. It doesn't necessarily mean stroke, but you're probably going to act the same way either way. Right? Yeah. Like I would definitely, you know, see what's going on with them and just kind of talk, you know, they probably know they have that as a history or they know what's going on, but you know, that weakness to the arm or the legs is going to be what kind of, just because they have a droop face that you kind of starts building a case, but then, you know, they're able to move both their arms with their legs. You know, I would start doing a little more investigative work and trying to work into that process. Yeah. So you've seen strokes on the rig, right? Yes. And what would you say was kind of the all encompassing thing that everybody had that really you were like, okay, they're in danger. Um, it's, you know, that's that weakness to one side of the body, you know, you can see them, you know, they're not able to form their words correctly. Uh, maybe they're repeating the same phrase over and over again. They're just not able to gather their thoughts. And then, you know, that weakness to one side or the other, you know, it's pretty obvious. And even then, you know, sometimes you have like a, a mini stroke or TIA that you're like, oh, this is a stroke. And you get them to the hospital and all the symptoms have gone away. So, you know, that's a mini stroke, a TIA, but, you know, without doing a head CT, you know, things like that. It's kind of hard to say what's going on. So this is something yeah. you probably need to get checked out at the hospital. All right. Perfect. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry to derail us there. You're uh, right. Next up, trauma. Yeah. So you know, I was thinking about you know, head injuries. You know, someone's in a car wreck. Uh, this could be from blood loss. You know, they got gunshots. So that's kind of a broad. And that's kind of what we went over, you know, the March algorithm. You know, that was kind of a major trauma, but any kind of major trauma can always cause someone to, whether they're going into shock or whatever, can cause them to act abnormal. Yeah. And this one, I mean, if you watch any videos of people kind of after bombs go off overseas in Afghanistan and Iraq, th there is a, like a really a lot of confusion and altered mental status. One of my, one of the most interesting videos is in the TCCC course that I took and it showed an Afghan commando got blown up. And there was multiple people within the blast radius, including the company medic. So they go over and he's got some clear amputations and they're trying to, they're trying to take care of him. And the medic spends an inordinate amount of time trying to cut this dude's pants off. Like you, hmm. you're just watching it, just like screaming at the screen. Like what, like, what are you doing? Throw a tourniquet on it and move on. This guy's like got major trauma everywhere. You're the guy in charge of it. And I'm not trying to criticize in any way, shape or form, but he is just focused, like just laser focus on cutting pants off. <laughs> and uh, it was just very interesting because you can see clearly, clearly that he has a traumatic brain injury, that he has altered mental status. And uh, uh, the rumor I heard was that he actually passed away from a TBI because it was undiagnosed and just went, went back, went to sleep mm. and never woke up. But uh, it is a very clear indication of that altered mental status and definitely worth watching if you can find it because yeah, that trauma, it, it messes with him. It's interesting that he had that but he knew like through his training that he had to get the pants like the leg exposed he just wasn't able to progress past that you know what i'm saying like he knew what he was supposed to do but just could not get you know the brain just wasn't firing on, on all cylinders yeah it was it was really interesting and and you know it's sad and frustrating and and just definitely one of those that stuck with me you know the brain uses a lot of energy and oxygen so the moment that you start messing with that kind of stuff it just is not able to fire on all cylinders so whether this be you know it doesn't get enough blood flow or the sugar's messed up whatever the brain automatically it just it's a very crazy look machine that just doesn't you know if everything's not perfect it does not fire correctly yeah 100 percent. anything else on trauma no i don't think so i think that's kind of a broad idea but you're just you're kind of thinking about you know 
uh, shock, you know, penetrating trauma, blunt trauma, you know, whatever's going on that can always call someone to not act normal. Yeah. Plus just plain and pure panic. Yes. Sense of impending doom style things. Exactly. Medications. So yeah, like medications can very easily cause someone to not act right. This could be maybe they've had a change in their over-the-counter medicines, like the doctor changed some of their dosages or changed to a new drug, and all of a sudden they don't start acting right. So you know, looking at the patient's history, uh, in EMS we we can talk about a sample history. Uh, so we talk about signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, past pertinent past pertinent medical history, last oral intake and events leading up. That kind of helps us build this case. So looking at those medicines and they're like, oh, grandma just started whatever. Then, you know, maybe let's look at that drug and say, maybe is that causing grandma not to act right? Like this is maybe it's a new, whatever, hypertension medication, whatever. So let's look at it and just kind of see if there's been a change in her medical problems or medical history recently and kind of go from there. Uh, maybe we need to call a doctor and say, look, you started her on Simicor, but now she's not acting right. You know, maybe we need to change, go back to something different and um, have a conversation with the doctor about that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, my experience with altered mental status or one of them was a guy that I was sure it was tough to say. It was tough to say whether it was alcohol, narcotics, over the counter or illegal, uh, but he just definitely wasn't acting right. And this is the guy that literally just fell out of his car driving down the road. And then his car crashed, almost crashed into me. And uh he had a pillow and he was bleeding pretty profusely from his right arm. But man, he was, he was so altered that I really, really had a tough choice that day. Yeah. And like you said, it can be, you know, there's a lot going on. So you kind of have to start narrowing things down, but it can be very difficult. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see. Is that, do we, so, yeah, like over the counter and then like illegal drugs. Yeah. Um, opiates, heroin, fentanyl, like that is all like in the news right now. Um, and it's being, most of it's being over exploited, if I can say that correctly. Yes. Because people are just panicked about this stuff. Um, one is fentanyl. I'm like, oh my gosh. Like I was on a call uh, with a, a local officer who had his uh, like regular, like, um, I want to say combat gloves, but they were just like the kind of gloves you see cops wearing, though they don't get stuck with sharp objects, things like that. Yeah. Um, and he's digging through the car and he finds uh, some stuff in this guy's car and uh, white powder stuff. And I was like, okay, cool. No big deal. And he's like, oh, let me get my fentanyl gloves. I was like, your fentanyl gloves? <laughs> yeah, I've got some gloves that are for fentanyl. I was like, oh, okay, I want to see your fentanyl gloves. And he goes, opens the trunk, grabs a box of gloves that look very similar to the ones that are my ambulance, puts these gloves on. He goes, okay, now, now I feel safe about touching the fentanyl. And I was like, uh, you know, you, that doesn't, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> and he's like, what? And he's like, no, I get, you could die from this. If one little speck gets on your arm, you could die from fentanyl. I'm like, no, that is not how it works. You, you can't do that. Like you could literally put your hand in the fentanyl and the absorption is not there. Like you're not going to get, you're not going to die from it. And so you see, see all of these cops and I, I, I love the cops to death, but I'm like, we see the body cam footage of them like hyperventilating and going crazy. And I'm like, you have not been exposed to it. Stop. Just <laughs> calm down, take a deep breath and let's, let's figure out what's going on. You know, even the self-administration by the cops with Narcan, they touch the fentanyl and now they're hyperventilating. They're like, oh, I need some Narcan. I need some Narcan. And they squirt up their nose. That is not what Narcan is for. Um, Narcan is for someone who has overdosed on whether it be heroin or fentanyl, some kind of opiate, and they were in respiratory failure. I mean, they're not breathing, they're being very slow. Uh, they're going to be unconscious. That's when we give them the Narcan. Not when they're hyperventilating, running around like a chicken with their head cut off. They don't need Narcan. Like, they're just fine. Yeah, no doubt. It, the, I mean, there, it's a it, it's a pretty big thing. I watched like a Vice News thing on it, and yeah, craziness. It is, and you know, at the end of the show, we're going to talk about an after action report uh, video for this, and that's kind of you know where a um, uh, there's firefighter gives Narcan to a gentleman, and he wakes up, and the ang this guy is very angry now, mm -hmm. and so um, I've run that case where you know it's most of the time. Like Narcan for us, we give just enough to get them breathing. 
you know, like they're breathing four times a minute, six times a minute. We're having to bag them. So we give them a little bit of Narcan and you get that respiratory rate up, but we really just kind of want to leave them alone. Uh, but it does happen. Sometimes you push a little too much and now the patient's awake and they're either one, they say they didn't do anything like, Oh, I didn't do any drugs. I'm like, okay, let me explain something to you, sir. We just gave you some medicine that reverses that kind of stuff. You were sleeping and now you're wide awake talking to me. So I'm going to call bull crap. Yeah. Or they're really pissed off that you just ruined their high. So, you know, if we can give just enough to, to kind of get their breathing better, that is much better than now. All of a sudden you have a violent patient because you just ruined their high. Um, and that's exactly what happened in this video. So you know, just be, I, I did a video on about, you know, Narcan, do you need it? And I was like, I really don't think you need it. Like I think a, a good bag valve mask with an airway adjunct and you can manage this scene very calmly uh, until first responders get there without needing Narcan. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. It, it's, it's definitely a thing. Hopefully they're, good information gets out there instead of just the knee jerk stuff that we're dealing with right now. Yeah. Because if and it really is now you can go to CVS or wherever your local pharmacy and you can pick up Narcan and buy it. Um, if you get a prescription for pain meds at your uh, doctor's office, they're supposed to write your prescription for Narcan now as well. So like it's, it, it is a big deal and I get it. Uh, but I think it's being over popularized. I'm like, you just, it's not that it, it is a big deal, but it's not a big deal. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, I totally 100%. I don't want to, you know, say it's not, it's just sometimes things get way overblown. Exactly. You know, if, and Narcan can be given, you know, as a shot in the arm, you can go in the spray in the nose. So there's a lot of ways we can give it. Um, you know, if you have a loved one that has a drug problem, then absolutely, you know, look into getting Narcan. That way you can try to help them through the drug problem and get them off of it. Um, Cause it can be very, you know, it could be a problem, but you know, just, I don't think everybody and their brother needs a, a thing of Narcan rolling around in a car. Yeah. 100% agree. All right. So next is seizures. Yeah. Seizures are another common that we get called out to. Um, and they can be scary for the bystanders looking around, but typically they're not, you know, life threatening. It's more like the, the people around them are scared. Uh, there's a couple of misconceptions when it comes to seizures, you know, trying to hold them down is not the best thing to do. Um, you're not going to be able to hold it down. They're going to, if they're having a, the one where they're jerking all over, uh, they're going to be flashing, you know, uh, flashing around like, um, flailing. What? Well, yeah. Flailing. That's the word I'm looking <laughs> for. Um, you're not going to like, they're flashing around. That's a whole nother idea. Um, but you know, you're not going to hold it down. So just kind of move objects away from them, but don't try to hold them down. And the other biggest misconception we hear with this is I stuck something in their mouth. They wouldn't swallow their tongue. Um, you cannot swallow your tongue. It's impossible. Uh, it's attached to the bottom of your jaw. It can fall back and occlude the airway. We talked about that in our airway uh, podcast that that's the number one occlusion, but you can't swallow it. So don't stick your finger in their mouth. Don't stick a piece of wood. Don't stick a towel down in their mouth. Uh, don't do any of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, now, seizures are kind of an interesting one because as someone comes out of a seizure, they they they, their humanity disappears for a little bit. And as they come out, they're very, very, uh, you wrote here disconnected, which is kind of the best word that I can think of. They're extremely disconnected. They are confused and just like, I don't know. There's like a cloud over the humanity of the person is what I've seen. Um, it, I had someone happen here in this office specifically and to sit there and watch them come out of that. And, uh, I, I did a sternal rub and, he voiced a displeasure <laughs> as he was starting to come out of it by that point. And it was funny because when he came out, he's like, yeah, I could see s shapes and stuff. And I kind of had an idea of what was going on, but I just could not, I couldn't connect that, that part of my brain to the part that I talk and, and formulate thoughts and things like that. So yeah, it was, it was very odd, but you could just see the, the humanity blink back into the eyes. Yeah, and that can last for a few minutes. That can last up to hours, depending on the patient. You know, they can be post uh just for you know a few minutes, or it could be something that takes a long time. And you're right, like they are disconnected. They can be you know just staring straight ahead. Uh, they're kind of you know, pouring sweat because the neurons in their brain are just firing like crazy, and that's what causes this problem. Uh, they you know they can be very confused for a while after a seizure. Yeah, it was it was pretty interesting. There's a few types of seizures, you know, the kind of the main ones we could talk about are like the grandma. And this is like the full body shakes. This is 
what most people kind of associate with a seizure. Uh, all the muscles kind of tighten up and tremor up, um, and the arms, the legs, the whole body is shaking. And this can last for several minutes, uh, you know, or maybe a few seconds to several minutes. But, you know, they're again, just trying to keep things, objects out of their way so they don't hurt themselves while they're seizing. And then kind of keep track. Because what happens is, you know, you call 911 and say, hey, this guy's seizing, and it takes EMS seven minutes to get there. And I'm like, all right, how long has this guy been seizing? Oh, he's been seizing for 15 minutes. Uh, okay, well, you didn't call us 15 minutes. So you called us seven minutes ago. Like, let's figure it out. So trying to keep an accurate time of how long they've been seizing uh, for. Maybe it was just 30 seconds. Maybe it was for a full minute and a half. But try to keep some time uh, down where they they were seizing. And like I said, these seizures typically aren't life-threatening until they start having multiples, like back to back to back. And that's where it's a problem because they seize. There's post for a minute or two afterwards with that just staring off. They're, you know, sleepy. And then they seize again. And then they seize again. Like that becomes life-threatening uh, episodes. But just having one seizure is typically not, not life-threatening. It's that multiple back-to-back is a problem. Yeah. Infants and, and toddlers are, are an interesting case. I, I saw one not too long ago, um, just kind of sitting there and suddenly head rolled back a little bit of a seizure and then just 30 seconds of silence, uh, eyes open, clearly there, but there's that disconnect again. And then once, once that fog cleared, that cloud cleared out instant, just wailing, crying. <laughs> but, yeah. So we'll see these a lot in infants. It's the febrile seizures. You know, they have, they've been running a fever, the fever spikes and the body's like, holy crap, this is a really high fever. And it's really not. Typically, I've seen it's not it's, the temperature is how quickly it spikes. Maybe they go from like 99 to 102 within just a few minutes or you know a short amount of time, and the body's like, oh crap, this is bad, and they have a seizure, and that's how the body breaks the temperature there, and so you get there, and mom and dad are hysterical because mm-hmm. little Johnny had a seizure, and you're like, oh, what's going on, with little Johnny? Well, he's been having a runny nose for three days. He's been running a fever. We've been fighting it. We've been getting Tylenol, Motrin. Then going through this and, and all of a sudden now like, oh yeah, it's a fever seizure. He's just fine. He won't even get admitted to the hospital. So, you know, we'll take him, maybe he gets a little bit of fluids and get checked out, you know, get some Tylenol. But typically these kids don't even, they'll hopefully never have another um, seizure again. And, um, but the parents are more of the patient than the actual child. Yeah, that was actually the case with this one as well. The mom was super freaked out. In fact, I think it was her. I don't want to say overreacting. It was her response to it that I think scared the kid. And then that caused the kid to cry once the cloud cleared. And uh, yeah, it's important to be relaxed and, you know, as calm as you possibly can be, because if you're freaking out, everyone's going to freak out. Exactly. You know, especially these little kids, you know, if I touch them and they're burning up hot, you know, go ahead and take their uh, shirts off, take their pants off, you know, go ahead and like, expose them, leave the diaper on, then you take the diaper off. Uh, but, you know, kind of let their body start to cool down a little bit. And then I'll start talking to mom and dad, like mom and dad, little Johnny's been sick. He had a fever. This is his body's now like, I'll kind of go through and explain it to him. And then they're like, okay, like, let's go to the hospital and just kind of double check. But this is what's going to happen and kind of talk them down too. So they're not panicking. Yeah. hundred percent. And the other one you can have is like the petite mall. And that's kind of where those are weird. Like, you may be talking to someone and then all of a sudden they just stare out in left field and it's like 30 seconds and they come back and they just start talking to you again. And you're like, what, what, what was that? <laughs> and so it's like this disconnect where they just stare off or they're just gone for 30 seconds and they come back to you. Um, so those can be, uh, those are fun to do like that. They're just fun. Cause like you can be talking to someone and all of a sudden their just head tilts up and they just look away from you. You're like, Oh, Jeff is seizing now. Okay, cool. We'll be back in a minute and, and they come back and start talking to you. That's so interesting. Um, anything else on seizures? I don't think so. Just making sure that, you know, they don't hurt themselves and, you know, there's no need to put anything in their mouth. Uh, they may bite their tongue and you can manage that afterwards, uh, but don't stick anything in their mouth. All right. Got it. Low and high blood sugar. Uh, we talked about a story that I just dealt with recently on this one, but lay, lay it down for us. Yeah. So diabetes, I mean, these people, their lives revolve around their intake, uh, whether it be fluid or be food. And it's, they have to be very, you know, the good diabetics are very cautious about what they eat, what they drink. Uh, if they're outside exercising, you know, they, or they get sick, 
uh, they are constantly having to monitor their blood sugar. And so they may have an insulin pump. Uh, they may have, you know, it's, it's on their belts, one of that, and they, it automatically puts the right amount of insulin in there. Maybe they have to check with a machine and they have to take a pill. Uh, a couple different options that these uh, people have for blood sugar. But man, bless their heart. Like they have, it's it's very difficult for their lives, especially the kids. Like that, that always like, the kids like, I can't do that because of my sugar or whatever. Or they've been sick. Uh, you know, diarrhea, vomiting, and now their sugar's way up. And so it, it's a very, very sad situation. But you know, most people monitor very well. Um, when I worked for the rural service, we had a lady, you know, we worked uh, 24 48, and it was every night. This lady at, at between 12 30 and 1 o'clock, her sugar was going to drop like every night. We knew it. And she was a terrible diabetic. Like she didn't eat right. She didn't do anything like what we tell her to do. But you could almost guarantee, like bank it that if we got off another call, it was like 11 30 at night, right? Well, I might as well stay up because I'm going to go see so and so in a few minutes. And sure enough, she would call. Oh, and so we'd go out there, give her some uh, D50, which is a uh, sugar basic like IV, bring her sugar up. We'd fix her sandwich and we'd tell her good night. I'm like, it was almost like we were joking. We were like, all right, we're headed back. Like, what if we just sleep at our house and knock on our door and like just go ahead and do this now so we can go home and go to bed? Um, but, you know, some people are very good about this and some people are terrible about it. So uh, you can have a couple of different emergencies that happen here. Uh, low blood sugar, which is hypoglycemia and high. Uh, blood sugar is hyperglycemia. So then the low blood sugar typically happens very quickly. You Maybe they uh, took too much insulin, didn't eat, or they've been sick for whatever reason, but it starts to fall. So typically less than 80 on their readings is what's going to be low. And this happens very quickly. Uh, if they're awake, then we can give them, like we talked about the last episode, the cake icing, um, something, you know, it's got some sugar in it, some simple sugar to get it up to get it back up to a normal range and maybe we need to give them something to eat afterwards but as long as they're able to swallow maybe we give them you know, we mix like sugar and orange juice all the time like you just mix it and get them having just drink as fast as possible and that will help get their sugar back up and like i said this is something that typically happens very quickly quick onset they're acting normal and now all of a sudden they're not acting right so uh, maybe they have a machine hopefully and we can give them something to get their sugar back up before they go unconscious yeah. The high blood sugar typically happens over several days. You know, they've been sick or for whatever reason, they just quit taking their insulin or they've been out of it. Whatever happens, happens. And then they're, they're, they don't, don't act, they're not acting right. And so you check at their blood sugar now, it's maybe three or 400. Um, I've seen it as high as uh, like 800 to 900. Um, I don't think I've, I only have had anybody over 1,000, but I've heard stories. I've never had one. But, you know, typically that blood sugar between 80 and 120 is what we're looking for. And, you know, they, these people can be, you know, a thousand or 900 and they're unconscious. You can smell like the sugar coming off their breath and mm -hmm. they're peeing like crazy because their body's trying to get rid of the sugar. So, but you can smell it on their breath. Like, you just smell that sweet odor. And you're like, okay, you're either drunk or it's your blood sugar. And you can kind of go from there. Um, but that that's the fruity odor you get. It's like they're intoxicated, but it's just the sugar coming off their body. The body's trying to figure out how to get rid of it. And so this is something that happens very gradually, typically over, you know, several, a long period of time. Yeah. And I think that is called ketosis, right? I believe so. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think, you know, if we have the opportunity to actually use it correctly, I think this is the time to do it. <laughs> but yeah, like that sugar, that sugary breath, which is actually not pleasant. It's uh, the few times that I've smelled it. It's, uh, it, it's definitely like sweet and, and not, not good. Yeah, it's not good. Like I say, when I say sweet smell, you're like, oh, chocolate. But that's not it. Like it's not, it's not like you smell like it's kind of hard to describe over a podcast. But if you ever smelt it, you, you'll you'll know what it smells like the next time. You're like, all right, that, that's not right. Yeah, put a peach in your armpit for a week and then smell it. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty bad. But <clears throat> so, yeah, this is the one now for low blood sugar. I've seen a couple different times just people completely confused and just kind of not even themselves yeah and a lot of times these people are just pouring sweat too and they, they look like crap you're like oh my gosh and it's their blood sugar their blood sugar is you know 30 or 40 and you know they're, they're not talking right um so, some of the worst times i've been cussed out by the little old ladies whose blood sugar are low and like they're like you wake them up and they're like Oh, honey, sweetie. Like they're the sweetest little old ladies. But man, when their sugar drops, like they're like cussing like sailors and they're foul. Like, oh my gosh. And, you know, they, 
uh, we get their sugar back up and they're complete sweethearts. They teach Sunday school. So, <laughs> yep. you know, just kind of, it's crazy there again, like the brain uses a ton of sugar and when it's not getting that, it gets very angry. Um, so it's definitely interesting how the brain works. Yeah. hundred percent agree. So how do you tell the difference between the two, between hyper and hypo? So for me, I, during that investigative work, I would find out, you know, the onset was it gradual or was it sudden? If you're like, oh, grandpa's been sick for several days and he's not acting right, then I would go, my guess would be high. If you're like, hey, we were playing softball today and uh, he came in from pitching and all of a sudden he was not acting right, he was fine the two minutes before that, then I would go with low. So typically that's how I diagnose without checking their sugar first. It's like, all right, how long has this been going on? Did he, was he acting fine five minutes ago? Now all of a sudden he's not acting right. Or is this something that's been kind of going on for several days? Yeah, hundred percent. This, yeah, this one pretty freaky, pretty crazy, and the personality changes are are interesting. Also, very dangerous, possibly. Exactly. You know, you can die from either one of these. I mean, you can die from your sugar being so high that you you die from that. You're in DKA, you're in shock, and you you can die from it. But also, if you run out of sugar, then the brain doesn't function, and you, know, you can die from that as well. So. Uh, both of these are very dangerous situations, you know, not to be treated, treated likely. Yeah. I'm still convinced that Tony Simon had low blood sugar, even though he said he normally runs around three something. And I think the glucose test that we did was four something. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I think something was weird. I think he had low blood sugar. It was just every single checkbox was ticked. Yeah. But Interesting. Who, yeah. Either way, Skittles fixed it. Skittles fixed it. We should we should see if we can get sponsored by Skittles. <laughs> we should <laughs> taste the rainbow. Also, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, dementia, which is it, it's a big thing. Um, it's a scary thing. One of the scariest things for me to think about as I get older. It is, you know, the Alzheimer's dementia. They just kind of get grouped together uh, into one big group. But man, it is sad. Like this is uh, our elderly patients typically who their short-term memory is gone. Like they don't remember what they did yesterday, uh, but they can remember back what they did when they were 14 or 15. Uh, you know, their husband, you know, they remember that exactly. Uh, but they don't remember what happened five minutes ago. And it it's so sad. Like it, there again, like I've seen it you know, where people didn't recognize their own spouse. They've been married to you for 50 or 60 years and they didn't remember. They don't remember who their spouse is or whatever. So um, it's very sad. You know, we could talk about, you know, like, like the older guys. Like I, most of the like most of the guys we transport now, like they've all been in the military. So you talk about what they did in the service and they can remember back that that service time, their younger days, but then they don't know who the president is. So they don't know, you know, anything of the current events, but they just remember that time that they were in uh, for the younger part of their life. And it can be sad. Like I, that, that's the part that gets me the same thing. Like my, I think about, you know, growing older, like I want Kenneth and I like to grow old together and yeah, I want to die first. I don't have to deal with that. But, <laughs> um, you know, just that, that time, like, it's just sad to see these couples go through this. Yeah, absolutely. So what are some signs and symptoms that, that we might keep an eye out for if we come across, you know, grandma or grandpa? So that, um, that, talking to grandma and grandpa and all of a sudden, you know, they're having trouble remembering names, uh, that memory loss, you know, as we get older, you're going to get some kind of some memory loss and, you know, it's kind of hard to remember things as well as, as sharp as we did before, but it's that, all right, what was your grandkid's name or what was my daughter's name? Like it's stuff that they should remember, uh, that we need to be on lookout. You know, this, you know, what was my, um, where did I leave the door keys at? Where's, where's my car? I lost my car. I drove, you know, to get groceries and I can't find my car. And all of a sudden your mom calls you and she's frantic because she thinks someone stole the car, but she doesn't remember she parked it two rows over. Um, so it's those events that are starting to occur where our parents or grandparents are starting to lose the memory more and more often and it, stuff that they should know. And that's when we probably need to look out and get, you know, some help with that situation. And maybe it's getting a sitter to come into their house or maybe they need assisted living uh, but this could be a bad situation. Maybe they forget that they turned the stove on or they forget they had hot water running, um, you know, or they, they lose their car. They, they get lost driving back home. You know, this could be some scary situation. So maybe thinking about being proactive with this and getting them a sitter, getting them some help. Uh, because if grandma falls because, you know, her memory's going or she loses her balance. Now she breaks a hip. 
she could be in a lot of trouble from a broken pelvis. So uh, be be very much in contact with their family doctor about these situations. I'm totally going to do this again to you and put you on the spot, but we've talked about infections, strokes, trauma, medications, narcotics, seizures, hyper and hypoglycemia, dementia, and Alzheimer's. You walk in, grandma has an altered mental status for the skinny medic. What you, we, you talk about that investigation uh, yep. and you're not, you're not EMS or medic or anything today. You're just average everyday Joe. Uh, there have an altered mental status. How do you break it down? How do you, what, what's, process what steps do you go through to figure out what's going down so for me uh, i'm gonna we'll start from the very basic like we did before i'm gonna check their airway breathing and circulation make sure their airway is paid and i don't need to do anything about that make sure they're breathing okay and then let's check a pulse uh look at their skin condition you know does it feel hot to the touch does it feel cool and clammy uh you know do they have a good pulse is it fast there again that kind of help me if i touch them and they're burning up hot then i can start leaning down towards the infection route. If they're cool and clammy, okay, let's start going down to, they feel like they're in shock. Let's go through that. Um, maybe we talk to family members, talk to them, hey, do they have any problems with diabetes or anything like that? Uh, and maybe if they're awake and talking to me, we perform that stroke exam that we talked about. Mm -hmm. You know, get them to hold their hands up. Can they smile for me? And then going through and talking to the two bystanders and saying, hey, what happened here? Uh, the cause, you know, this event and that sample history, like we mentioned earlier, that's a great way to kind of help define this and go, all right, well, there's signs and symptoms, you know, signs being something that I can see symptoms are being what the patient describes. So vomiting is a sign. Nausea is a symptom. So kind of going through that and then, you know, asking family members or the patient, if they're able to, what are they allergic to? Uh, that helps me. And the medications that if I see that they're on insulin, they got a list or they tell me they have, then that's going to kind of guide me towards maybe it's their blood sugar. Uh, but look at their medicine, you know, do they have, are they on, you know, uh, hypertension medicine or do they just start antibiotics for something, you know, they're on penicillin or uh, whatever for antibiotics. And then the last row intake, well, grandma hasn't ate anything all day, or we just got through eating a cheeseburger. And then events leading up, can, the events leading up can tell a big story. You know, they were fine. And also they fell to the ground and started shaking. Okay. Or, you know, we fell from the roof and now we're here. So doing that sample history can kind of help guide without having all the tools in the toolbox that I would bring, then kind of helps you guide that situation and figure out what's going on with our patient. All right, man. That is awesome. Let's, uh, anything else, any, any other things to wrap up for all the mental status? I don't think so. I mean, obviously I think there's probably more stuff that can cause altered mental status, but these are the big ones that I could think of. And I think these hit the major ones that people may see uh, while they're out doing life and maybe never know when you'll be the first responder. So uh, you see these kind of events happen. All right, cool. Let's move on to the video of the week. And you've alluded to it a couple times. Why don't you just uh, kind of break down the scenario for us? Yeah. So uh, this gentleman, um, you can just I, you can put it in Google, uh, you know, guy shoots firefighter after receiving Narcan. Um, and there's several YouTube videos that pop up. It's a body cam footage. This guy was unconscious. Um, and firefighter gives me Narcan. He wakes up. He doesn't want to go to the hospital. Gets very agitated and pulls a gun. Uh, the officer, they, they scatter and the firefighter in, ends up getting shot. And that kind of, it, I, I thought about this podcast about the ultra mental status. I thought about our, previous podcast where he talked about seeing safety and you know the fact that i said in that podcast that there was no bright neon sign saying scene's not safe scene's not safe i think if you interviewed the first responders that were on this call like they would say there was no like neon sign saying this was getting ready to happen there were some small steps that kept getting broke down small things that happened along the way that snowballed you know the officer uh this guy's unconscious nobody checks the waistband nobody watches the hands um, we give too much Narcan, we woke him up. Like there's a lot of small things that went wrong with this that caused this firefighter to, to get shot. Yeah. It's a pretty awful scenario. And it is. I mean, it's, it's a worse, I mean, it's a bad situation to be in. And, um, so that's kind of, you know, when, when I teach first responder classes, EMT classes, or even talking to the cops, you know, they're, I've seen cops give, you know, be, and 
like not making fun of the cops again, but bless their hearts, you know, they get a ribbon for every time they give Narcan, they get a little ribbon on their badge. It says I've had three Narcan saves. So what happens is they find this guy like, Oh, heroin. And the officer so-and-so gives Narcan up to the right nostril and officer so-and-so gives Narcan up the left nostril. So they both get credit for the save. And now all of a sudden this dude's awake and fighting them. I'm like, stop doing that. Like, don't do that. Like I, <laughs> he doesn't need that two doses of Narcan. So, yeah. you know, just to be careful with that stuff that you can, you know, it, it can be bad. And then always, always check for weapons. You know, we, we beat that, you know, with a dead horse over here recently. You just check the waistband, watch the hands and make the scene safe. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. Now let's move in and do product of the week. Um, we talked a bit about these last week, but what did you want to talk about? Yeah, just in case you guys missed it, uh, you know the TX2 and the TX3 tourniquets are now on our website, and we uh, these are a ratcheting system. Uh, they have a either a two inch wide band or a three inch wide band, and they um, come across almost like a blood pressure cuff you would see, and they have a ratcheting system that's going to occlude the blood flow for. So, it doesn't have the windlass like we've seen in the past. It's a different style tourniquet. Uh, it being wider, I think it's going to hurt. Uh, the least amount as other tourniquets we've seen. Um, but they're a good option. I think to look at, they, they fold really flat. Uh, so not gonna take a lot of space in your backpack or your first aid kit, your trauma kit, whatever you choose to carry it in. But I think it's a good option to look at. Uh, the main thing I liked about these was the fact that the manufacturer says you can train with it. The one that you're going to carry, the one you're going to use, you can train with it. So you don't have to buy, um, you know, one tourniquet to put in your trauma kit and then a blue, cat to practice with you can have just one and you can practice with it but also you could use it if you needed to yeah Th these are definitely interesting to me i have every intention to pick them up you know when the committee for t triple c put out all their new recommendations they had everybody kind of scrambling just because there's so many more new ones now to get familiar with and to learn about and do all that stuff so these are 38.99 for the tx2 and yeah uh, just $39, there's a little bit under $40 for both of them. You know, it's like not much difference between um, the two and price is the size. The two inches and three inches, you know, maybe the two inches stores better for your kit, things like that. But uh, they're pretty similar in price, just a little under $40. All right, cool. And they're available there and you can use coupon code civilian medical to get 10% off as well. Correct. All right, cool. Um, let's see. I had a couple things that I wanted to mention. First off, uh, we got uh, some feedback. Our producer, Benjamin Allred sent me a message. Uh, it was just kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Maybe I have dementia. I don't know. <laughs> is your uh, sugar low? Maybe. I don't know. My, my caffeine is low. I can tell you that. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. He said, did you see this? Uh, we got a message from Patrick S to the civilian medical Facebook page said, Hey guys, just wanted to share a quick story about how awesome your show is. I haven't been able to find any civilian medical training in my area. So I've done my own training with first aid through the red cross. Stop the bleed and your podcast. Yesterday I was leaving work and stopped at an intersection due to a red light. As I was sitting there, a car pulled out into traffic and right into a motorcycle. I was first person on the scene and was able to use some of the knowledge that you both have talked about to manage myself, the motorcycle rider and the people standing around until first responders arrived. So thanks for what you're doing. Keep it up, Patrick S. And then follows up by saying that being said, skinny medic, if there was enough interest, would you be willing to come to Wisconsin to do some training? Mm. I think you're closer to Wisconsin than I am. <laughs> I think uh, you should do it, man. Get that's up awesome, there. though. I love the feedback, though. Like that, that's cool. I love hearing stories like that. Yeah, that is that is truly awesome, man. That uh, that makes the long, hard hours. No, I'm just kidding. This this show is pretty easy because Skinny Medic does all the work. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that is awesome, Patrick. And good job. I mean, we've talked about the scene safety, self safety. We've talked about everything, like. You guys have the tools out there. You definitely need to go get hands-on training and do it. But when you spend time, th when you spend time thinking about these things, you know, you react and you react and respond. And clearly Patrick is a testament to that. Um, you know, he paid attention and then he did the right things. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely love it. So thanks for that feedback. And I bet you skinny medic will come up there if you just hassle him a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> so do that if someone wanted to hassle you about coming up and doing a class, where would they do that? They can go to medicalgearoutfitters.com and they can also visit skinnymedic.com. So uh, we have typically not traveled in the past uh, to do classes. We make everybody come to us. So 
Uh, I would tell Patrick, South Carolina is beautiful. Uh, the humidity is a thousand percent right now. Uh, so you sweat as soon as you walk outside. But, uh, you know, come to South Carolina, fly into South Carolina, come see me. All right, fine. If you don't want to fly to South Carolina, I will go to Wisconsin. <laughs> I, I love the Wisconsinites. <laughs> That's funny. All right. That's awesome stuff. So don't forget civilian medical or I'm sorry, civmedical.com is the place where you can find us. You can find Dietrich at skinnymedic.com, medicalgearoutfitters.com. And don't forget for, you know, that is where I buy my, my medical gear. In fact, I was literally just pricing out cause I need to build a new kit, but I need some IV bags and all that good stuff. So uh, I get all my stuff from medical gear outfitters and I always make sure that I use coupon code civilian medical for 10% off. Uh, any final parting words about mental status, Patrick S or just anything else going on? No, I think that's it. Um, I'm excited. Um, something different. It's, like it's a little bit different episode. We've got a couple of people we're trying to get on for interviews and a couple of companies. So I'm excited what we're doing in the future. Yeah, I can't wait. And don't forget, guys, uh, this is just a little bit of a teaser. But next episode, St. Fisher. <laughs>